Nuestro siguiente conferencista, Tom Russo, tengo el honor de presentarlo. Es un buen amigo y extraordinario inversionista. Tom es socio fundador de Gardner Russo and Gardner desde 1989. Fue pieza clave también del reconocido fondo Sequoia Fund. Es un gran inversionista y además tenemos el gusto de invitarlo por primera vez a México. Tom, welcome to Mexico and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I, Alejandro, if you stay up here for a second, I was intent, intending to ask Alejandro to stay up here the whole time since I flew in at five o'clock this morning. I thought maybe he could wake me up periodically as I'm speaking in case I fall asleep. But, um, I don't have to worry about that anymore. After Jose Antonio's presentation, I am wide awake. And I will stay awake for the rest of the afternoon just thinking about which shares in my portfolio to sell so I can buy some FEMSA. <laughs> I, it, I, I look down the list. Let me tell some, something about that. Uh, Tom tuvo una cena y una reunión muy importante en Nueva York eh, el día de ayer. Y con tal de cumplir con el compromiso de estar aquí, que muy amablemente nos había aceptado, voló durante la noche sin dormir para poder estar presente aquí en el evento. Así que, además de ser un gran inversionista, es un tipo de primera y estamos muy agradecidos por ese compromiso que asumió con nosotros. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, and I am, I am absolutely delighted not to speak Spanish. Um, I, I am, because I have a lot of work to get done, and I don't think I want that to go to my head, I think. Of, um, but anyways, if you think about what um, Jose Antonio offers, um, I can easily find some room from selling shares in Nestle or Cadbury or Heineken, SAB Miller, which are all in my portfolio. The last two, of course, are considered to be candidates to buy or to partner with uh, Jose Antonio's beer business. We could part company with Unilever, Perno Ricard, um, you'll get a sense. Um, one of the things that struck me so powerfully about Jose Antonio's uh, presentation is at the end of the day, he's focused on culture, firm culture, 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 on family, family values, family values as owners of the company, and then family values as they go through the company down to those commissionaires, I think he called them, who ran the OXO businesses. Um, and then most importantly, as any CEO of a company is, is burdened with, the responsibility of, of creating and nurturing a culture and then uh, taking that culture into places where he has the capacity to reinvest money for a very long time. Um, you, can't, you can't find many businesses uh, that have the kind of prospects that FEMSA has to reinvest money for a very, very long time through their OXO operation, but also through taking the businesses overseas. And I'm, I'm just terribly impressed. And I think all of, the, all of the people in this audience should know, and quite frankly, I look around the world. I travel all over the place. I was in Africa last week. I was in Holland two weeks ago. Um, I'm looking all the time around the world for businesses of the kind of stature that FEMSA offers you in your own home market. So you should feel very proud of the uh, accomplishments and the standing of that company. Um, let's see, thank you Paco and Alejandro and Whitney for the um, uh, insight to create this um, opportunity to speak. You sponsored um, a value investing uh, seminar in Mexico and I think spreading the gospel of value investing um, will bear fruit through future generations, and I'm delighted to be a participant in just what amounts to the second ever of these uh, seminars. I am a global value equity investor. Uh, I oversee about $3 billion, 65% uh, of it's in non-US companies, much like FEMSA or Nestle. Uh, my focus is on global food, beverage, tobacco, and media companies uh, with a large holding in Berkshire Hathaway based on my heritage there uh, as a, as a um, follower of that company. My clients are largely taxable, so um, I invest for the long term and try to get tax um, deferred wealth appreciation. And I typically manage a small portion of my clients' money. And I do that purposefully because I find that if I end up managing too large a portion of an investor's funds, that there's an emotional burden that comes with that, that requires that you be right all the time because investors tend to have an emotional need to succeed that is often unmeetable. 
and in the in the world of investing, you have to be able to um, uh, absorb periods of time when you're massively out of step with the market if over the long time you're going to outperform the market. And that combination of being able to withstand uh, underperformance and having clients who become overly demanding of you if they have too much of their money at stake with you has led me to have a policy of trying to maintain a very small exposure to any one client's fund so I have the equanimity to invest uh, for the long term in a way that makes sense to me. Um, I'm honored to uh, follow the presentations of other investors so far. Uh, and also the business folks, um, Jose Antonio, as I mentioned, and Roberto. I was particularly um, pleased to follow Ro Roberto's insights that were based on his experiences. Um, uh, he, he shared with us a photographic memory of the developments of the Mexican financial markets. I mean, he took us back to 1971, he took us back to 87, 94, 98, and he, he seemed to have such an extemporaneous an unscripted ability to go back over time that he reminded me a bit of uh, uh, the uh, recently published book about Andre Agassi. And I realized what a masterful uh, businessman uh, um, Roberto was, because just like Andre Agassi said that he remembered every one of the thousand professional matches he played in his life as though they were just yesterday. Uh, Roberto so engaged with the um, development of the financial systems in Mexico that he could have just spent hours, I think, talking about the, um, the history. I was most interested in when you referred to the 1971 um, efforts that Mexico engaged in to try to recruit capital from other markets and to find that the, uh, the regulations did not allow cross-border investing. That's only four, um, 38 years ago. But you think about how fluid capital is today. But in 1971, he couldn't really, he could not get North Americans to invest in this market because of border controls on, on, on pension funds. Um, he mentioned the tequila crisis that took place at some point along the way. And I hope it's a different one that might confront Paco and Alejandro and, and I tomorrow when we go see Heredura. That may be a different tequila crisis. Um, and, then, and then he had a, um, so many of his observations had to do with Mexico's financial markets as being influenced by the rest of the world. And I think that's just such an, an interesting observation. The crash of 87 in North America had a carryover effect on you. The ruble crisis in 98 with its effect on you. Our countries lacks um, uh, treatment of, of liquidity and the kind of chaos it's caused everybody. Um, truly inter interconnected worlds and worlds that are so linked that it really speaks to the reason why I choose to be a value investor. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, I, um, what, what I hope to do is to include my earliest um, impressions of investing as, um, uh, at Stanford Business School in 1981, what lessons I derived from early experiences there, how it shaped my investment career. Um, the points that I take away um, from, from business school when uh, Buffett spoke to our class were several. First, the government gives investors just one tax, well, one break, and that's the tax deferral of unrealized gains. That means that, um, you know, if you can find something you can hold for a long time, the rate of return on that is much higher after, um, than to, to trade uh, fiercely and trigger a lot of tax, uh, taxable gains along the way. The second um, has to do with circle of competence. Um, do you, should I do something with the microphone? Yeah. Come on. Am I too loud? Okay. So the second had to do with choosing your circle of competence, which as an investor, it means do what you're good at and figure that out early and then f find uh, how broad that circle is and stay within it. For me, that turned out to be food companies, beverage companies, tobacco companies, businesses that had powerful consumer brands, and more importantly, had the ability uh, in many instances uh, to grow globally. Um, Buffett to our business school class suggested that investors only have 20 good investments uh, during their lifetime, so they should be selective and, um, and, and not, uh, not engage in um, you know, hyperactive in, uh, trading. I think I've probably found six investments over the 30 years that I've been doing this, so I still have 14 to go. Um, one point he made, which has been terribly important for me, is you can't make a good deal with a dishonest person. 
Um, that has to do with the ability in, in the investment business. We all give our money to people like Jose Antonio to invest it for us. That's really the act of investing. Is I'm, I'm, I receive funds from investors who say that they trust me to do something smart with their funds. I give it to someone like Jose Antonio, and if I'm lucky enough to give it to him in particular, he'll do something smart with the funds. And nothing will have to happen for the next 20 years because of the reinvestment opportunities and the careful way they run the business. If he were dishonest, uh, there was absolutely nothing I could do to police that relationship. And so you start with the um, understanding that you just can't get around dishonest people when you go about the investment business. Um, clearly, everybody understands, and it's hard, harder to do than it uh, sounds, that you should invest in businesses as though you're buying the whole company. Um, What's intriguing to me about today's presentation, this format, <coughs> is that you have business people speaking alongside of investment people. And that's, that's very consistent with how, how I think proper investing should be um, handled, which is that you should invest in companies as though you're buying the whole business when you make that investment decision. And then the marketplace is there to assist you and not to inform you. And so what the market will do is it periodically will panic and give you a chance to buy great businesses at, at too low a price. And, um, and that's, those, are the, those are the messages that I received as a 23-year-old MBA student um, at business school. And then how I interpreted those, I guess I prioritize them slightly different than, than Mr. Buffett did to our class. But first and foremost for me, it's people. Uh, you cannot make a good deal with a bad person, and, and, and high-quality people like you just saw speak before me will, will delight you again and again and again in a way that will carry your capital much farther along than, than, than not. Um, tax efficiency makes a huge difference, mainly because if you invest with the idea that you're going to hold an investment for a very long time to be tax efficient, the hurdle that you have to overcome about information for the company is just much greater. And you're going to spend a lot more time understanding the business when you go into it if you think you're going to hold it for a long time. It's like dating, I guess. If you were to, if you were to say that every person you dated you knew was going to be your wife, you'd probably be much more demanding of the relationship when you start out. Um, it's certainly the case with investing. Uh, most of Wall Street is built around telling you to do things frequently. And, and um, Buffett's partner, Charlie Munger, had uh, help, helps on this issue when, when asked what he does whenever he's thinking about making an investment. And he asks a very simple question, and then what? And so in the investment business, if someone says, do you buy General Motors because the Cadillac division would have a good offering next year, um, you're supposed to then say, and then what will happen? And if the answer is you'll sell the shares, once that car comes off the line, you're not going to make much money. That's not a, a particularly useful way to invest. And so the tax efficiency means that you're investing in a business like FEMSA with the, assured with the belief that the 7,000 OXO stores that are today operating well will someday be 15,000. And uh, beyond that, the, the only question is how far they reach geographically. And you'll be just making a tremendous amount more on your investment um, some many years out. And, and that's, that's roughly the level of, of sophistication and assurance that you need if you're a long-term investor. Um, let's, uh, global is, is, I guess, the last feature that I would introduce to the lessons um, that I took away from class and also through my practice. Um, in, at Business School in 1981, our business school professor, Jack McDonald, suggested to us at the time, which was quite heretical, that you invest abroad, that America, the United States that is, only has 4% of the population of the world, and most American money at the time was invested only in the Ameri U.S. stocks. The U.S. equity market at the time may have had 50% of the world's equity market value with only 4% of the of the world's citizens, and that's an unsustainable environment. 95% of the people who drink, who enjoy chocolate or smoke cigarettes or go up and down buildings live away from the United States. And so in 1981, the advice was to invest abroad, and I certainly, I certainly embraced it. Um, back then, when, when I spoke to investors about my vision of taking my lessons into action, 
I almost uniformly was asked by American investors when I mentioned that we'd be investing in Nestle and other foreign companies in the early 1980s. The questions were always, first of all, can you trust the accounting? And my instincts at the time were compared to what? Americans, the United States investors, had a belief that we had this um, pristine form of accounting, and if you invest with other companies, you would somehow be at risk, the fact that their accounting standards were more lax. And the great example, again, was Nestle, which in 1987 only published um, an annual report that was um, sort of fully reliable, and then they had a mid-year report that just gave sort of sales by region. And it wasn't very, um, it, it didn't look a bit like what the American market demanded of its companies. And so um, most American investors could not invest in Nestle because it could not get a listing on the exchanges as an exchange listed ADR because it didn't have US style accounting. Well, nothing could have been um, more unprotective of American investors when companies like Enron used our style of accounting to put up the kind of financial games that they did. And Nestle's never stumbled because of the fact that it spent 25 years using semi-annual accounts. Um, and so I think you know, going global has made a big difference for me, um, even though the, the early investors worried about the accounting. The second thing they always asked at the time I started investing abroad was, what about currency? And my answer to that was the same as it was to accounting, compared to what? Because it presumes if somebody says, what about currency, that the that the dollar that they referred to would somehow remain untarnished. And, and I, I never really quite bought that. Um, at, at business school, there was a, a large number of my colleagues, classmates, who came from Mexico, Europe, Asia, all around the world. And to a person, they invariably had a much more global view of where to position their savings than Americans did. They had savings in Europe, they had savings in North America, some abroad in, in Asia. And they just didn't trust their own country to be um, able to withstand the kind of political pressures that might, that might damage the currency of just one nation. I always felt the same way about the U.S. and for a long time, most of many of my investors were worried about the currency. But over the past 20 some years, maybe 25 years of investing, for the partnership that I founded at business school, currency has actually given us about half of a percent positive return over over 20, say, 25 years. So having, having exposure to non-US companies has made a difference. Um, but the main thing that it's allowed our capital to do is it's given us a chance to reinvest. Um, landlocked companies that are primarily US only run out of room to invest. Um, a great example of that would be Anheuser-Busch, which for, for um, years was the most dominant brewer in the world. And they enjoyed the benefit of the biggest profit pool for beer in the world. But they never developed a global perspective. And ultimately, that led them to make um, poor reinvestment decisions and at the end of it all, to build a somewhat diminished culture. And they found themselves vulnerable to the, um, to the a company which started just 25 years ago as a small sort of one brewery out of, out of Brazil who now, now owns um, Anheuser-Busch, in part because um, Anheuser-Busch lacked that global opportunity. And I think that's one of the best uh, values to, uh, to have uh, in a global portfolio. Um, let's, uh, let's go to the prepared comments now. Uh, those were just introduction. The first thing I'd say is um, this is, um, this is an important image to remember as an investor. Um, last summer, June of 2008, my family uh, took a trip to Africa, and we went every morning out on a safari looking for the, uh, the big game, and um, almost invariably, w whenever we came upon a fierce-looking animal, the uh, guide would say to us, if you ever get separated from the group and you find yourself in the wild and you see a lion or you see a, a leopard or you see a, a warthog or... Um, an elephant or a rhinoceros or a, a bush dog or anything you could mention. The advice was always, if ever you're separated from the group and you're, you're confronting a, a treacherous looking animal, stand still, freeze, and don't move. 
Uh, and that was the advice given by maybe a hundred times. And when we saw this animal, which is called the Cape Buffalo, the man said, if ever you're separated from the car alone and, and you confront this animal, run like hell. And the reason why it has a place in this schedule is because of what it felt like to me in 2008. Um, I've always been taught to be a long-term investor and that um, you know you pick your investments, you think about them thoroughly, you set your horizon, and if there if there are downturns in the market, if there are setbacks, stand still, and uh, in the market, the bear market will ignore you. But midway through last November's collapse, I had a sneaking suspicion that we might have been looking at a a, um, a Cape Buffalo, rather than the um, traditional offerings of of. of African wildlife, and fortunately it turned out not to be, and I didn't run, but um, it is the dilemma you face as an investor is just how stubborn are you? And it's a particularly challenging issue when, like me, your instructions from birth as investor is to invest for the longest term. So you have to balance that pressure off the ugly nature of an animal like this, which you see every once in a while. Uh, this uh, photograph also has a particular role in my um, slide deck. Um, uh, it's global, obviously, and it was a slide that was given to us by a Nestle uh, chief financial officer uh, many, many years ago after he had just left being the country head in Japan, and he loved Japan, and he used this um, picture of the pagoda with the backdrop of Mount uh, Fuji. And, and he, he talked about the pagoda because it meant a lot to him as a Nestle executive and it speaks to culture. So he said that, that particular pagoda might be 700 years old. And then he said there's not a single piece of wood in that pagoda that's 700 years old, but that pagoda is 700 years old. 